Um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Full Circle for inviting me here to Brussels. It's always nice as a UK resident to visit a place where the weather is even worse than it is in <laughs> London. So um, that always makes me feel better. Um, uh, we were just talking about the fact that it's only 70% women here tonight, and I am absolutely amazed at the 30% of men uh, that have turned up, but I wonder if it's anything to do with the fact that it was billed great men, I think, on the posters. Um, and I really hope I'm not going to be too much of a disappointment to you, because I am not going to spend most of this evening talking about great men, but nor mediocre ones, nor dreadful ones. In fact, I'm not going to talk about men that much at all, really. Um, but I'm very thrilled that you're all here. It's not often you'll hear me say that I wish I was a man, um, but moments like this one, standing before you all, is one. And it's not only because, despite the equality debate that we're supposedly having this evening, um, I'm wearing what's described as a tie microphone. Um, and I'm sure there are many women in the room who will understand why, because there's absolutely no way you could put that on most of the things we choose to wear. Um, so, so far, so 1950s, really. Um, nor that I think that a man could necessarily do this better or with more gravitas, but because uh, gender equality is far too easy to dismiss as a battle between the sexes. It's simply not true. Gender equality is so much more than a debate about who wears the trousers and the tie and indeed the microphone to go with the tie. It represents the single most enduring barrier to our economic progress and it affects every man, woman and child under the sun. Already on our side we have some notable men uh, none more so than Desmond Tutu, the elder and statesman who's described gender equality as the greatest unresolved human rights issue of our time. And he's right. It pervades every corner of life, whether personal or political. It holds back men, it holds back women, it holds back children. It stifles growth and human progress. It fuels wars and economic collapse. Two-thirds of the world's illiterate are women. The countries where the gender gap is greatest are also the slowest developing economies. There are so many compelling reasons for why furthering gender equality makes sound financial sense. So why the hell, as the biggest aid donator in the world, is Europe not doing more? Like many women my age, I grew up with a feminist mother who fought for the world we live in now, one where lucky women like me have rights enshrined in law that protect my right to vote, work, have my choices respected, and my rights protected. And yet, throughout my life, I've earned at least 30% less than my male colleagues. I'm now in 2015, which is uh, 45, mass is never very much my strong point, but about 45 years since the second wave feminist, embarrassed to take my 10-year-old daughter into a news agent because I have to explain why the magazine racks are covered by women wearing their underwear, and I don't really have a particularly good excuse for it. When I go further afield, I'm filled with rage at the basic human rights denied my sex across vast swathes of the globe. One in five women will be raped in their lifetime. One in four will be the victim of domestic violence. And many, many millions will never be given the basic tools with which to improve their own lives and those of their children and their communities. You may think I'm being a bit of a drama queen. I'm often accused of it at home. But despite the enormity of its negative impact on global economic progress, we seldom see the topic of gender equality addressed in our headlines. We do, however, see the symptoms of our failure to address it. Migrants flooding to Europe in desperate hope of escaping hardship. Women trafficked as sex slaves from poor countries to the developed world. Kids reared on internet porn who see girls as sexual orifices rather than equals. Girls denied the education that could make them economically independent in adulthood. Women still dying in childbirth. Uh, visiting Liberia on a regular basis, as I have, I'm constantly amazed by the extraordinary women of the peace movement there who followed their triumph of bringing to an end the bloodshed of the civil war by voting in Africa's first female president in a landslide, women-driven, free and fair election. They continue to have their focus fixed on political and business power rather than the superficialities of feminism, from bra burning to sexual liberation, that have too long been banner headlines but really mean nothing to the quality of women's lives. Gender equality is not about women taking over. 
It's about recognizing that women and men have important and often distinct qualities to bring to the table, and that equality leads to better outcomes for everyone. It's something the women of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Rwanda have realized and pursued, having seen the worst excesses of unmitigated masculinity. And the results of such focus on achievable and tangible goals speak for themselves. While Africa experiences its great leap forward with economic growth rates, which are the envy of us in Europe, and women thriving more than ever in business and politics, the story in Europe is, by contrast, surprisingly depressing. But let's keep positive for a moment. There has been a great deal of progress towards gender equality in my lifetime. Women have entered the workforce in ever greater numbers. Politics is becoming more representative. We're getting used to seeing men pushing prams around European capitals and women flying planes. But you know what I'm going to say next. It's been too slow and too painful and it's not nearly enough. And what's more, we seem to have entered a period of stagnation. Let's take the issue of violence. In the UK, two women are killed by their partner or ex-partner every week. And that figure has remained completely unchanged since the data started to be collected 40 years ago. This isn't just a UK problem. Across the EU, 62 million women, that's 33% of us, have experienced physical and or sexual violence since the age of 15. And the thing is, the really frustrating thing, is that Europe should be leading the way on this stuff. If we don't want to be forever immortalized as small-minded, detail-obsessed and bureaucratic, if we want to convince Eurosceptics that there really is a vision to this amalgamation of nations, then we need to start showing the world what our values really are. And surely the absolute tip of the iceberg, the indisputable founding principle, has to be equality for all. And believe it or not, that includes women. Europe is... Do you want to get that? <laughs> Europe is, for the most part, prosperous and peaceful and democratic, especially when compared to much of the rest of the world. We enjoy many privileges compared to our brothers and sisters globally. We have full participation in education and laws which facilitate equal access to the labour market and to politics. We have active welfare states which provide a safety net for the most vulnerable in our communities. We have health systems which have all but eliminated things like preventable maternal deaths and the deaths of under fives. We have labor saving devices like washing machines and dishwashers in practically every home. These things make a massive difference in the fight for equality between men and women. We're not fighting elementary battles like the right to drive or access to a trained birth attendant, which holds so many women back from realizing their full potential globally. And given all of our comparative privileges, why is it that we're not doing so much better on either achieving gender equality or exporting it as a basic, non-negotiable human right? Doing so would benefit us here in Europe and also help create livelihoods in nations where at present risking your life to get to our shores and do our lowliest jobs represents an improvement in living standards. If we take my birthplace of Oslo, the Nordic countries, out of the equation, Europe is in fact doing incredibly poorly in advancing gender equality. We are only 1% ahead of sub-Saharan Africa, where women make up a regional average of 23% in national parliaments. And then the stat grows to over 40% in countries like Rwanda, South Africa, Senegal, and Namibia, putting us, quite frankly, to shame. Politics is a hard nut to crack, perhaps, but even in spheres like employment and pay, Europe is nowhere near where it needs to be on gender equality. In employment, women in Europe are underemployed, underpaid, and unrecognized for the work they do in the home. They enjoy fewer leisure hours than men and still do the majority of domestic work and caring for children, the elderly, the disabled, and the infirm, most of which, as we know, goes unpaid. In short, women may work for more hours than men for less recognition and less, if any, reward. That doesn't make for happy relationships, it doesn't make for happy children, or a healthy social environment. And despite equal pay for equal work being enshrined as a founding principle of the European Union in the Treaty of Rome in 1957, before many of us were even born, the average pay gap in the EU is 16%. In fact, it's worse than that in Europe's biggest economies, 22% in Germany, 
and 20% in the UK. The income gap, which goes beyond hourly pay to compare women and men's total incomes, including bonuses, is 37%. And the pensions gap, oh, well, that's 40%. And not only is this not improving, it's actually getting worse. The European Institute for Gender Equality published its first gender equality index for the EU in 2005. It measures the gaps between men and women in six thematic areas, work, money, knowledge, time, power, and health, giving a score of 100% where there is full equality. In 2005, the EU scored 54%, so that's halfway there. Later this month, EGA will publish its second index for 2015, and I'm told by sources I couldn't possibly reveal, a bit like FIFA at the moment, uh, <laughs> that it will show that this figure of 54% has not changed and that in fact nine EU countries will score lower than they did in 2005. Can it really be that the region of the world commonly thought to be the most advanced on gender equality is actually going backwards? And then there's violence. In its groundbreaking report on violence against women in the EU, and I say groundbreaking because there's never been a significant study of violence against women and girls in Europe before, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, or FRA, found that one in 10 women has experienced some form of sexual violence, and one in 20 women in the EU has been raped. One in three women in the EU to have experienced violence is already unacceptable. But this too appears to be a worsening situation. In the UK, more than a thousand threatening or abusive rape remarks are made on Twitter. Personally, I think it's a lot more, as that's about my average a week. Um, abusers have found a whole new sphere for enacting gender abuse against mostly women, but also those expressing feminist sentiments, and that's online. The digital sphere has been a double-edged sword in the fight for gender equality. On the one hand, it's democratized and globalized the struggle, grassroots activists like Saudi Arabia's Women to Drive campaign and social media campaigns like hashtag Bring Back Our Girls have mobilized people globally. There's still, sadly, no sign of those girls. However, the death threats, the rape jokes, stalking and largely anonymized abuse unleashed via social media, the easy accessibility of ever more hardcore porn and violence, the online communities of child abusers, the prevalent sexism and normalization of violence of the gaming world have all opened up a new frontier in the struggle for equality and one which policymakers have so far almost entirely failed to respond to. Recently, two concerned headmasters in the UK, one from a private school and one from a state school, went public with their concerns about the climate in, in classrooms, saying that homophobia and racism were happily in decline, but sexism, misogyny, and unprecedented pressure on girls to conform to por pornographic ideals were on a very sharp increase, and yet we're still sitting on our hands. These are difficult issues to navigate. The beauty of the internet is the freedom it opens up. And while I'm not calling for government censorship, neither do I want my 11-year-old accessing live rape scenes at the click of a mouse. We have standards we expect from advertisers and from broadcasters, and we expect them to adhere to them. We hold them responsible. We must ensure that those using the internet to market, sell, and influence are equally accountable. When you think about it, the internet and cybersecurity is a classic cross-border issue, the kind of issue where collective action is needed. And given the obvious gender dimensions, we at the Great Initiative will actively campaign for the EU to develop a digital strategy which takes proportionate action to protect women, children, and men from exposure to imagery that depicts criminality masquerading as pornography, prevents stalking, abuse, violence, and fear online. And that's where I want to move the last bit of this speech to, asking and attempting to answer why it is that in Europe we've not got further than we have, despite so many of the odds being stacked in our favour. I've got four ideas why we're not here toasting equality, uh, but rather dreaming or aspiring to it. The first is complacency. 
we think we've already got there. When we hear about Boko Haram kidnapping schoolgirls from their desks, the Taliban shooting Malala in the head, girls in Syrian refugee camps being married off age 12 to protect them, it's easy to think of gender injustice as just simply something that happens elsewhere. But as I said, just because we're not fighting the very worst manifestations of gender inequality here in Europe, that's no excuse for us not pushing the debate forward and looking beyond our own borders to this global village we purport to belong to. We should be doing more, we should be further ahead. Number two is co-option. Once we get there, we conform. Too often women who gain power think that with, the, that, that with that the struggle is over. Or they conform, mimicking male power rather than <coughs> challenging it. The suffragettes didn't see the vote as an end in itself. They saw the vote as the instrument through which they could remake society as a whole. And we've not been ambitious enough. Getting into parliament or the boardroom is not enough if parliaments and boardrooms remain unchanged. In this respect, I applaud the Swedish, who wouldn't? Foreign Minister Marco Wallström, who has bravely embarked on an unashamed feminist foreign policy to the ire of Saudi Arabia, for one, who cut diplomatic ties after she condemned the ban on women driving and the public flogging of the blogger Raid Badawi and put an end to the lucrative arms deals between the two countries. We must similarly continue to put our principles before commercial interests. Then there's care. In my opinion, care is the long neglected sphere of life where inequality is starkest. Getting women into the workplace is only half the battle. Getting men into the home is the other half. Or perhaps that's just my husband. <laughs> Outside paid employment, men enjoy more leisure hours than women, and women still do the majority of housework and care. Caring professions also reflect this trend. For example, in the UK in 2010, there was no male trainee nursery school teachers, not a single one. And this leads me on nicely to my final point, and unfortunately it doesn't alliterate like my other three Cs. Um, it's men. 30% of you that are here tonight. Um, I'm sorry to say it, because maybe all this talk about women has left you feeling quite smug, actually, for being here and listening to me rant on, like you can happily tell your friends you're a feminist and tuck into your coffee and cheese boards. And the fact is, you're, you're right, because for too long we've kept the debate solely one-sided. Men have been left unengaged, untargeted, and excused from the conversation. And the fact is that if we are to close the gender gap in Europe in my lifetime, and in the rest of the world. We have to stop talking about these issues as women's issues, and we have to engage men and boys in the struggle. You are all of you, sons, some of you fathers, many of you brothers, and certainly husbands, partners, and friends to women. We need solidarity, as every battle for human rights across time has also required. And much as I appreciate the sentiment, this cannot just be simply as supporters cheering us on with the UN's he for she hashtag. <laughs> Firstly, we have to start by recognizing that gender inequality affects men too. The pressure to confirm to what society considers manly, to be strong, to go forth and conquer is just as preposterous as what society considers feminine traits to be, like caring, communicating, and empathizing. You should see me on a Friday. Uh, with boys, four times more likely to be excluded from school. Men, three times more likely to commit suicide. Three times more likely to be frequent drug users. And making up over 90% of prison populations. Isn't it time we all sat down and had a chat? The great initiative, the gender equality charity I founded and am trustee of, is doing just that. We work in secondary schools with teenage boys in London, and one of the activities we run is called a word race, where boys line up and write the first words that come into their heads that they associate with the words man and woman. Across all social groups and ages, the top five words associated with man were strong, hairy, job, penis, and muscular. And for women were boobs, vagina, baby, long hair, and pussy. Which takes me right back to the magazine racks that I don't want my daughter to be exposed to. It's grim, isn't it, that these are the bare stereotypes that define us, that the terms man and woman, woman can, so simply be split us, can so simply split us into groups, defining our behaviors and creating divisions that ask boys to man up and girls to take up less space. 
and that continue to create survivors and perpetrators of violence in a binary cycle of oppression. Men in this room and beyond, in many ways, the next steps are up to you, not stepping up to save women, but stepping in and asking each other to challenge and to redefine masculinity. I never want to hear a girl asking how she can stop herself getting raped. I want to hear every boy and man stating that being physically strong and powerful is nothing to be proud of if that power is only used to oppress. I said I'd end with a few words about the great initiative, and here they are. You probably haven't heard of us, so I'm very, very grateful to Full Circle, not only for the weather check, but for giving us the opportunity to come to Brussels and speak to new audiences about what we can achieve together. We are in some ways typical of very, very small charities, though I hate the word charity and think of us more uh, as an advocacy unit. We're powered by a very dedicated board and team. And advocating gender equality, believe it or not, isn't a very big fundraiser. We struggle financially and we're always looking for the next donation. That's just a quick hint. <laughs> um, but in more important respects, we are different and we punch well above our weight. We're the only charity in the UK which has gender equality as its guiding purpose and the philosophy of working with men and women. And finally, one of my proudest achievements at GREAT is passing a new piece of legislation in the UK, the International Development Gender Equality Act. This mandates our government to consider gender equality in how it spends every penny of our 11 billion pound overseas aid budget. Our law means that every UK funded development project has to consider how it can promote and encourage gender equality as one of the criteria for being allocated funding. The EU is the biggest aid giver in the world. Just imagine what could be achieved if it simply enshrined the same basic principle. Not only in terms of tangible on the ground action in the developing world where it's desperately needed, but as a unifying principle for equality that proves how our squabbling family of nations can achieve so much more together than apart, just like men and women. If there is one thing I want to leave you with today, it's that Europe can do better. Quoting Juncker, this isn't a small thing. This is exactly what Europe needs to be about, an equal playing field for all. Thank you very much.